Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please rise as the Muscadine Mafia welcomes you to the graduation ceremony of our own beloved that I know of that has made six figures profit during his time in the in the, in the uh, mentorship. Can y'all believe that? Six figures. Now, without saying the size of his account, his account is a sizable account. So he, uh, but he certainly does have uh, quite a bit of over $100,000 profit in about a four or five week time. That is amazing, y'all. James, congratulations, young man. Thank you. Hey, are you showing your uh are you showing your your face? There we go. There's James. All right, James. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. It's good so, to see you. It's good to see you. I miss talking to you every day. Every time we, <laughs> we get into these mentorships, I'm used to seeing everybody every single day. And uh, you know, it kind of gets uh, kind of gets weird after we say goodbye for a little bit. But we're going to certainly keep in touch and everything. But uh, James is a very different breed than most of the other people that have gone through the mentorship. And he kind of already had another strategy that he wanted to do. You were the first person that came in that said, "Yeah, you know, I'm not. Uh, I don't think we're going to do the one, one, one." So tell us kind of how you develop your strategy prior to us even getting together. Well, Bobby, let me, uh, let me use this opportunity to first say, I'm just uh, humbled to be here in the room uh, with uh, everyone else and uh, much respect to uh, the trader nerd community. I, I have learned a lot and am still learning. So I'm a student here and, uh, but I just appreciate the work uh, that's going into the trader nude, uh, the trader nerd community. And, um, I have just gained, uh, an awesome amount of, uh, material from that. And then of course, Bobby, I want to, uh, say to you that I especially appreciate, uh, you and, uh, what you've, uh, helped me accomplish and, uh, helped me learn about myself in, uh, in these ever changing market conditions. But, uh, so I had researched for the last uh, seven, eight months and tried to come up with a, a, a strategy. And uh, so my, my core strategy is around credit spreads, but I implemented some of the stuff that I learned from uh, the community here and um, on a, maybe a different level, but, but using uh, uh, to some degree, a put debit spread uh, and then hedging uh, with some of that and uh, uh, really with a core strategy of credit spreads, but also implementing the uh, diagonalized uh, 90 DTE harvest uh, at a 60 DTE, that kind of thing that has really helped uh, enhance uh, what we were doing. So again, much appreciation to, to everyone. Well, James, what was your background as far as before trading, kind of tell everybody, you know, where you are in life and, and about your business and all that. I think it's a great story uh, for those out there that are entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs. It's really a, a, a just a wonderful story. Well, and and I don't want to take up everybody's time on this, but uh, I'll quickly go through uh, that. Um, when I was 17, I started uh, school for uh, pilot training. That was my uh, childhood dream to become a pilot. And uh, so I finished the academic part of that, but the flying was expensive and I was putting myself through that. I got a job with a masonry contractor as a laborer uh, to help supplement and ended up uh, redirecting and going into the masonry business and in construction in general. And, uh, but I did circle back to, uh, uh, piloting 
But that's how I got in, a, in business and uh, eventually in 1994 became a business owner, started a business with another gentleman and we did okay. And eventually took those profits and put them in the real estate uh, uh, market and uh, did okay there too. And so recently uh, I have uh, uh, just kind of closed down the, uh, the masonry business uh, it's, it's, it's a hands-on 24 seven operation with 200 guys. And so decided that, uh, I was ready to slow down. So I, uh, uh, eased out of that, kept the real estate going and then just started, uh, I'm not one to sit at home and do nothing. So, uh, I started, uh, researching, uh, strategies on selling options. And James is one of those people. He's in an enviable position to where he doesn't have to do this. I mean, you really could just sit at home, you know, eat your bonbons and go to Bora Bora twice a year and, and just have a good old time. Right. So why, where's the fun in that? <laughs> yeah, where's the fun in that? So here's the fun part, though. So as successful as he has been in business, I think his fire and zeal for trading is equally as big of a part of your motivation, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's just cool to see that, you know, someone who really doesn't need to trade, but still finds excitement and satisfaction in going into the market and trading. Uh, you're right, Bobby. It has really given me something to uh, focus on. And uh, I really enjoy um, uh, the strategies put forth out there. I really think you have a very good strategy going on, and I believe it uh, uh, would fit uh, most people's uh, goals and what they're trying to do. And I will say this is the first Discord that I became a member of. And, um, you know, Bobby, I mentioned this to you before, but I found Bobby um, on Elite Trader. I didn't know who Tasty Trade was. I didn't really know who anybody was, but I, I read a hundred page uh, conversation that took place over, I don't know, six months, a year. And uh, they were really ganging up on Bobby, but Bobby was, uh, uh, he was asking some real questions and, uh, and, and they were, uh, you know, a lot of those guys, uh, were, uh, there was a lot of fluff out there, but Bobby was asking some real questions and was doing things by the Greeks. And, uh, uh, eventually I found out that he had this discord. So, uh, I migrated over here, but, uh, but I have, I have a lot of exposure to everything that's out on the, uh, internet. And a lot of that is, uh, you can pass it by, but I spent a lot of time because I was, just just learning and so you don't know what you don't know still don't know what i don't know uh but uh just just been a, a real pleasant journey and enjoyed the whole way here and just happy to have uh, uh found this place and also happy to have found bobby uh he has helped me a lot well i mean uh james you are, are like so many of our other folks that have gone through the mentorship you were going to be successful regardless of whether you go through this or not, because you have that thirst and that quest for learning that I don't think is ever really quenched in any of us. You know, we can go as high and learn, keep learning. And we all think that, Oh, well, we can finally rest. We know everything. And I think we all know that we're never there. We're all the time learning new stuff. And it's just great to, to be a part of your journey. So what James does y'all is kind of really simple. He sells iron condors for the most part in SPX and kind of what are the, the deltas? You're selling them about a hundred points wide, right? hundred points wide most of the time. That's correct. hundred points wide. Uh, and I'm in the um, seven to 12 Delta um, market conditions will dictate a little bit of that. Um, so, putting it out there on a 90 DTE or closest to 90 and then harvesting, trying to harvest at uh, 30 DTE uh, uh, or at uh, 60 DTE. And um, if, if there's profit there, we harvest, if not, uh, we, we wait. 
And uh, in theory, there should be a 50% profit at that point in time, but you know, theory is just theory. So uh, it, it depends on a lot of other factors, but, um, uh, and then managing at a 30 Delta. Uh, so if we breach a 30 Delta on a short strike, then we, uh, we've got some work to do uh, to uh, move things around, but putting on daily and taking off every day. Uh, so it's a, a daily repositioning and, uh, you know, keep, keep the ball centered. So it, it's worked out so far. The market has uh, cooperated a little bit, um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, we're gaining experience and uh, trying to enhance it. And uh, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But it's a, it's a fun experiment. And during the experiment, what was so fun was he was uh, basically printing money from the start. I mean, basically, you were putting these things on, and they were printing money. You were seeing your net lit go up every day. And I told James, I said, James, I don't want it to be this easy for you. We want you to be tested and be tested uh, seriously because we wanted to see how James would respond to being tested. So. When we were together, tell everybody about some of the tests that came your way during the experiment. Well, when we started out, uh, we were in the, the market. Um, SP, uh, the uh, S&P 500 was around the, or SPX was uh, 38.50, somewhere around in there, 3,800. And uh, we were there for a few days and then it did take a move uh, north and, um, you know, got up in the uh, 4,100, was bumping against 4,200. And uh, so, you know, but, uh, and we were close to uh, breaching 30 Delta. And so we were practicing emergency procedures and uh, uh, figuring out uh, what our next move would be if we, uh, if we stayed on that. So, but it was really neat to uh, watch the net lick, watch the uh, Delta relationship, uh, watch the Greeks, how they, uh, they performed uh, and the theta, how it performed. And now the market has uh, fallen back a little bit. So uh, we're not tested on anything really anymore, but, but that day will come, but we have our emergency procedures in place. Talk to everybody about your trading plan and what we talked about with the muscle memory. This is what was really good because uh, uh, James was a lot like Trey in the mentorship. He was very visual in visualizing the portfolio, what he saw it as. And one of the things he brought up during the, the thing was in flying a helicopter and flying a plane, that there's such a thing as muscle memory. So tell everybody how that related to the plan and, and your emergency preparedness in your portfolio. Right. And uh, so as an example, flying in helicopter, uh, it takes several hours to even be able to hover uh, that helicopter. And it is about developing muscle memory. And uh, when you're flying that, uh, after you have developed that, you don't think about which direction or how you're moving the cyclic stick um, or the collective, you're, you're doing it automatically. And uh, so as soon as you feel something or as soon as you see something, your, your, your muscle memory kicks in and uh, you, you just do it automatically. So trading, uh, if, it, if it was able to be a muscle memory developed around that and as market conditions uh, evolved and they always do, and uh, as, uh, uh, as you feel something and as you see something, uh, that muscle memory, you don't have to think about it a lot. You just automatically make an adjustment and do those things, then it's a uh, it's smoother flight. Uh, my first uh, uh, training exercises were ugly. I did not have the muscle memory in flying that helicopter and I was all over the place. So uh, we're, we're a smoother flyer now so hopefully we can develop that into uh, uh trading as well james is it possible 
that you can, and I can show you where to do it if you hadn't done it, but is it possible that you could show, hide your account information um, and go into privacy mode? And I can show you that if you need me to, so that we can see the visual of what we looked at each day. I mean, I could have sit there and looked at it for hours. And I can share mine first if you need to, so that I can show you where to, to make sure you hide that. Well, let me, uh, uh, so do you have a share screen icon or something that will prompt me to yes, share the? Uh, yes, look on the thing. It should have, I've got it available for you to share. You should be okay. able to share. I'm so, looking for that button pop somewhere. Look if you've got a little Zoom logo down at the bottom of the screen. Okay. And see if it should have the screen sharing there. Over on the left, I've got uh, the mic I, uh, to either mute or unmute. It mm -hmm. says uh, video. I could either stop that, but I do not see the. Oh, here we go. Here we go. There you go. Now, y'all, I could have watched this all day long. This, I mean, there were times James and I would just sit here and look at it. Okay, here we go. This is a little PowerPoint that. Uh, oh, I don't uh, see it, it yet. I don't see it yet. Oh, here we go. Here we come. All right. So, yeah, look at this. Show. And this is one of the things anybody uh, considering uh, having coach and having uh, uh, Bobby uh, to mentor you. Uh, this is something that he will do for you to help you visualize, give you something you're somewhat familiar with and to help you uh, uh, visualize your trading plan and so on and so forth. And uh, just gives you, it really is an aid because it helps you become familiar. If you're familiar with something already and you uh, mesh that with uh, uh, your trading, then uh, uh, there's so many things that uh, you can connect the dots on and so many things will just kind of come together for you. And for me, it was uh, aviation. Um, so I started connecting the dots between aviation and trading. So we're inside the cockpit at this view here. Uh, so we're inside our our trading plan. We'll go to the next slide. And I, don't, I won't take up a lot of time. I just I'll go through these quickly. No, this is great. Take your time. All right. So here's uh, now here we're on the outside of our our portfolio and our trading strategy. But there's, uh, um, you know, right now we're static. We're not in operation, but we want to show kind of how this thing will uh, will operate. So we've got a section, a slice that's going to be through the the wing here, and we'll bring that up right here. So here's, here's the uh, uh, profile of the wing, and this is how flight is accomplished. It's a very uh, amazing thing. The Wright brothers uh, uh, had something here, but, uh, and this has been really developed uh, with a laminar flow of air across a wing to be able to get uh, lift. So here we've got, uh, if we're going in a forward direction, uh, the wind will come around, the relative wind will come around this wing. And because of the shape of the wing, so how we shape our trading strategy will dictate whether we're gonna create lift or not. So how we structure it. So if this wing is structured in a way that it's flatter on the bottom, it's got a curvature on the top, and that create that wind has to come faster around the top side, creates a low pressure here, and uh, you have the high pressure and you have some impact here. And therefore, once you get enough speed along the runway, you will automatically be creating lift uh, from this low pressure in this vacuum here, and you will automatically come up out of the, uh, off the runway. So here's our market conditions on a trading strategy. We have these uh, market conditions that we're going in a forward direction into, and our direction of flight is uh, time. And uh, so we're not looking back on time, we're looking forward uh, into time. And then uh, the lift that we end up eventually creating in my mind was the, the theta. Uh, and that's uh, um, what we're achieving uh, once we get our, our trading strategy off the ground. Uh, the thrust, the fuel in the engines, that's our buying power. Uh, so that's what's uh, going to give us, uh, that's going to propel us and then our angle of attack uh, is the delta. So if you imagine the relative wind here uh, is horizontal, the wing eventually will be lifted to get 
to have an angle of attack. I'll show you that on the next slide. And then uh, the turbulence, there's your Vega. That's your up, down drafts and so on and so forth. And anybody that's flown, uh, there's turbulence out there. Some uh, moderate turbulence, light turbulence, uh, and sometimes it gets pretty bad. All right, so here's, uh, here's that angle of attack. So here was uh, something I realized quickly that if, if, if I'm going to increase the angle of attack and try to uh, take on too many deltas, uh, whether positive or negative, uh, then we could create a disruption of this flow of air across the top. And uh, once it gets disturbed, there's no more lift. And so we lose our ability, uh, uh, the ability of lift, we lose everything and our uh, strategy just will not work under this condition by, if we have uh, exceeded our critical angle of attack. All right, so now these are the steam gauges that uh, you don't see a lot of these, um, a lot of everything, everything is uh, electronic, but here's the steam gauges, uh, the way that I trained with these instruments. So here's our uh, airspeed and knots. And I take that, um, I, I draw a line between that and uh, our 200 DTE, zero DTE, the faster, uh, or, or, or a zero DTE, that's, you know, that's lightning speed. <laughs> Quick motions, everything's got to be really swift. But if you're at a 200 DTE, you can slowly take your time and, and, and work your uh, metrics. And um, so there's our airspeed indicator. And then the vertical speed uh, uh, gives you the speed per minute. It'll tell you how fast you're climbing. Uh, and these numbers here represent 500. This represents a thousand. So whether you're going 500 feet a minute or a thousand feet per minute uh, upward. And to me, that's our, our theta uh, meter. So our, we're gaining altitude and this is uh, demonstrated by this instrument. And uh, so to me, gaining uh, uh, altitude would be like taking on theta. And then here's our delta meter. This is an attitude indicator. And uh, from a pilot's perspective, we're in a climb. This is the horizon, the black separating, uh, the white line separating the black from the blue. That's the horizon. We're in a climb, about a 10 degree, 10 to 15 degree climb, and we're in a left bank. Uh, anybody uh, uh, familiar with aviation is gonna recognize that. So this will tell you how how much of an angle that you may have against the horizon uh, and that your angle uh, of attack um, to the relative wind, uh, it will tell you whether you're climbing or whether you're flying straight and level. There, there's also another instrument I'm not showing here. It's an, uh, an angle uh, of attack indicator, um, but it's not depicted here, but it also will give you that angle of attack. Here is our, um, this tells us how many how much altitude that we have gained. So at the end of the day, it, climbing from um, from sea level up to ten thousand feet uh, or so on, it, it'll tell you how high. And I'm equating that to the net lick. Uh, that's how how far or how much altitude that we've achieved. And then over here to the right, uh, this one is uh, important to me. And it, you have your rudder pedals that control the little tail wing, a little vertical uh, um, wing on the back. And uh, we always try to keep the ball centered. That's a coordinated flight to keep that ball centered. So to me, that's the portfolio metrics. Uh, your portfolio, if you want it centered, uh, keep your Greeks. Uh, and your portfolio metrics uh, right. And, you know, unless there's a really, really sudden uh, shift in the market, you should always stay close in here and be coordinated. So if you're in a slip uh, and you're in uncoordinated flight, the ball will either be to the left or to the right here. And you control this with the rudder pedal pedals. All right, and then here's a, a this is our course direction uh, indicator, the CDI. And this will give you the direction. And sometimes when you get your weather forecast, everything's clear, but 
you have pop-ups, you have uh, thunderstorms, turbulence, things that happen, and you may have to uh, uh, make a course correction. So with a um, strategy portfolio, with your trading strategy, sometimes there needs to be a course correction as well. Over here's uh, uh, just fuel gauges. You have uh, fuel in the left wing, fuel in the right wing. And so I equate that to the buying power. And then down here, uh, this, we were kind of early in the campaign here on SPX and we have the ball centered. And uh, uh, fortunately uh, today, I just looked at it again and the ball is, is right there in the center. So we're gonna push either on the right or the left rudder pedals to keep this thing and, and coordinate our, uh, uh, our Greeks and our portfolio metrics to uh, try to keep that ball centered as best we can. And finally, last slide, well, take that back, second to last. Hedging, here's the wing, and here's the, uh, the flaps on the wing. And so when you are going into slow flight, when you're uh, uh, taking off or when you're landing, you need to fly slowly, safely. And so these flaps, you let those flaps down and you can fly at slower speeds, decrease your angle of attack and fly at slower speeds. And I equate that to the hedging that is necessary. In aviation, it's necessary to have these flaps in order to operate. And to me in trading, it is a must to, to have a hedging strategy uh, to where you can uh, uh, sometimes slow down and uh, maintain your altitude while decreasing your angle of attack. Now, it is a drag. It does provide a drag on the portfolio. So, uh, um, you know, it, it, it will slow your uh, progress down, but it is necessarily necessary for safe flight. All right, last slide. Finally, just to wrap it up the way that I see it, in aviation, you file a flight plan. In, in trading, you have a, a trading strategy, a trading plan that you always put in writing and you adhere to it. Uh, you check the weather reports uh, and in trading, it would be VIX uh, and those kinds of things. Uh, you you uh, take the temperature of the market conditions while you're trading. In aviation, you always have a checklist, something that uh, uh, to make sure that you're not forgetting something, I would do no different with a trading strategy. And then here's a SIM training. Once a year, you go to SIM training uh, and you practice emergency procedures. And I see Bobby doing that at every session. He's in the SIM, he's checking the emergency procedures. What if the market corrects down or what if the market goes down 20%? What if it goes down 12%? So on and so forth, what are we gonna do? He's developing a muscle memory so that it becomes automatic when the time comes. You have a flight crew, and as far as I'm concerned, um, in trading, uh, the trader nerd community is part of the crew for me. I, I read all the stuff that I can find on there, and uh, I'm, I'm not alone in the cockpit is the way that I feel about that. Resource management, all of the information that's at your fingertips, put it in places where you can easily get to it. In aviation, same thing in trading. And then in aviation, you keep log books and you record your flights, you record your hours, same thing in trading. You record, you have your record keeping so that you can um, uh, keep a record of what you've done, what works, what doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's uh, probably a thousand other analogies you can make, but uh, that's what it means to me. No, and that's a beautiful job, James. Just a beautiful job. Trey says, James, I really like the pilot and plane metaphor. My son is a pilot, and we use those metaphors to talk about lots of things. Yeah. So, and and it too, it just kind of put everything in perspective with your trading and it enabled him to visualize everything. You talked about the hedge being a drag on the portfolio. As most of you know, I have begun adding seven day and 14 day hedges to the portfolio. And actually that idea kind of came from James and what you were doing. James, tell, tell everybody what you were doing with that seven day hedge in your portfolio with these iron condors. Well, I wanted to, um, and, and the credit spreads, iron condor, uh, you know, it was great for me because it, 
is, is, the risk is defined. And uh, if I could even further define the risk, uh, that was even, even better uh, for me. And so just in exploring and, and trying different DTEs, and uh, of course, there's always a trade-off, but uh, I did find that uh, the 7 DTE probably was, um, you know, it, it, was, it was cheaper. And uh, putting on that, it just freed up a lot of buying power. And it also, um, you know, it, it, the risk profile really looked good. Now I know in seven days, that thing expires and you have to keep maintaining those. And I am listening very closely to what's being said about the 14 DTE. And I'm uh, considering uh, going to 14, uh, 14 day DTE because uh, it allows for more time in case the market did shut down. It's a little more expensive, but I think it's the price of uh, uh, doing business. And uh, in, in all of my businesses, I, I am heavy, heavily insured. And so this is no different. So think of it as insurance. And uh, uh, if you're flying without insurance, uh, you're taking a big gamble. So, you know, don't trade without uh, provide, you know, without purchasing insurance, always have insurance. So James would buy the seven day puts and calls. He'd do them on both sides. And it on the risk graph, the risk profile, he equated it to the little rubber things that they put on for kids when they're bowling, right? So that uh, if the ball goes toward the gutter, it kind of bounces back in. And that's exactly what it looked like on your risk profile. Yeah, those little uh, uh, bumper guards or uh, gutter uh, covers or whatever. Yes. So that uh, uh, it, it does give you that perspective. Now, one of the greatest moments of uncomfort for James during the entire thing was one day when the market was rushing upwards and everyone knows what happens to our deltas when the market goes up is we get these extreme negative deltas so his metrics he was two short deltas and so I was like what are you going to do he says well I can't sell puts on a on a, such a big up day but it was great because he went back, looked at his metrics and said, well, I need to do something. So instead of sell, selling maybe the 20 puts that day or 20 put credit spreads, he's, I think we sold 10 that day or something, five or 10. And it was a great moment where he goes, hey, it, it doesn't matter what your market opinion is or what the market's doing or what you would normally do. He sold puts on an up day because the metrics called for it. And I thought that was one of the greatest uh, learning and stretching exercises that we had in the, in the whole program together, James. What about you? No, I thought so too. And uh, so we had some other aha moments. And, uh, and that's one thing, you know, Bobby, you helped me uh, explore the parameters of, uh, uh, of, of my risk tolerance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, we all understand ourselves uh, for the most part, but uh, when it comes to something new like this, uh, you know, trading strategies and trading options uh, new to me, uh, you need somebody to help you explore those uh, parameters. Uh, and so that was very helpful to uh, uh, figure out who you thought you were and who you really are. And uh, so th those are some of the exercises that you put me through helped me to uh, determine that and feel comfortable uh, with, with the, you know, with the trading that I was doing. And literally, y'all, it was like two weeks into the program. And, you know, your net leg was up. I think I remember one time it was up $85,000. So he'd made $85,000 of unrealized profits. The net leg had gone up 85000 And so he's just basically at that point, printing money. Then the market started going up and testing his calls. And so to make adjustments, he would take off trades that normally would be 50% profit. There were, I think one of them you took off was only at 1% profit, right? That's correct. And what he would do is then reposition new trades out, move the calls farther away. Then there were times on that up move where he would 
uh, only sell puts, right, and not add risk to the call side. But the whole time he was balancing this beautiful little structure of keeping the ball right between the puts and the calls. It was an actual beautiful thing to, to see. But as far as his net lick swings, I mean, he was up 85000 one day, and two days later, you were down like $20,000 on the entire account. How did that, how did those, seeing those type swings in the net lick make you feel, even though when we looked at it, your positions were completely safe? Yeah. So uh, it, it was there. And it's, uh, you know, you never like to see a red flashing light on your screen, but it, it was there. But I slept good both uh, both nights uh, or, or, or when it was uh, tested like that. And here's why I slept really well is because I could look over there and I could see I wasn't in jeopardy on any of the positions, uh, but I could see the intrinsic, uh, the extrinsic value. Uh, I could see that relationship. And when uh, if the net lick, uh, if it sucked out of the net lick, it was over there in the extrinsic value. And then if the extrinsic value came down lower, it was pushing over into the net lick. So I still had, I felt like control over both extrinsic value and net lick. So uh, I seen it in one or the other. So I didn't, it, it, I didn't see it as being gone. I just saw it as uh, transporting between the two. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know, it's really kind of cool. Now, James did a lot of thinking. This is a man of deep thought. And the time came where he said, uh, hey, wait a minute. I've got these long puts on the downside that would lead to me making outsized profits if the market were to go down 20%. But he had this aha moment where he said, you know what? That's not going to happen that often. So he was able to then devise a plan where he would sell additional puts to level out his max risk to the downside. Kind of talk about that whole process, James, because that was really fascinating when you said, hey, let me just level it up to the downside, sell that extra premium and collect that theta rather than banking on a 20% down move. Yeah, so, and one thing you, that you can do with the uh, uh, credit spreads on both sides, you know, and I, and so l let me just uh, caveat, I understand, you know, when, when you, when you put on calls, you're probably playing with fire, but we, we accepted the risk and, and, and we went, you know, we, we, we're doing that. So here's the thing. Sometimes it would be buy uh, or sell uh, 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 the put side and, and maybe nothing on the call side. And then other times we'd split it up and go a 20, uh, 10 tranche or, uh, you know, we'd buy more on the uh, put side than on the call side. So uh, there's a lot of uh, flexibility in uh, uh, where you're putting these things and looking. And, and that's why that spreadsheet is so important to me is take a look and see how many negative deltas do we have and what does that mean? And okay, we can improve that if we'll, uh, you know, we'll, let's plant a flag on, on this side or plant a flag on the other side or let's split it up. So there's a lot of flexibility in doing that if you know your Greeks and you are looking uh, to, uh, to see, uh, you know, how much, um, overall theta. And also the other thing we're looking at is the volatility and just to see if the market goes down uh, by a certain uh, uh, number, you know, what is the uh, loss to the net lick? And we're monitoring that and we're uh, putting on one side or the other based on what we're, what we're seeing in that spreadsheet. But there's a lot of flexibility there. And James developed his own uh, spreadsheet where he would you know, one of the things he would do is he would always record the VIX when he put a trade on and when he took a trade off. But you just had a lot of aha moments during the whole thing. What do you think the biggest aha moment during the whole mentorship was, James? Can you can you put it down to one big thing? I I, I can't pull uh, just one big thing out of the air. It's just a combination of uh, of those little things that to me was a big thing, and that as we progress through. The mentorship, it was like, you know, I, I had a difficult time trying to figure this out on my own. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, experience would have eventually 
you know, you figured things out, but the process was accelerated. The learning process was just accelerated uh, with the guidance and uh, um, being able to underline those moments and uh, just a good experience all the way around. And so the, the great thing is also that James, I mean, his confidence uh, really, really increased. And he's at a point of launching a second account, right? James, kind of tell everybody kind of what your thought process is on the second account that you're going to be trading. Well, the second account, uh, probably stick with the credit spreads. Um, but uh, just have done a lot of back testing. Uh, to see what has worked in the past two years, the past three years, even the past 10 years. Uh, and I realize, you know, back testing is only, uh, it's showing you unique moments that happen in, in history. And there's other unique moments that have, haven't happened yet. So you can't, you, you can't fit everything to a, a future curve. You can only fit it to the past, uh, the historical curve. So there's some error there if we if we think we're going to uh, mimic everything in the past, but it gives some sense, uh, some situational awareness. And so uh, I have back tested that a lot uh, on a, a 90 DTE um, harvest at uh, 50 percent and reenter and move the position reposition immediately upon harvest and. Um, um, uh, and, and maybe limiting, uh, letting it go uh, to test all the way to the strike uh, before moving. So let's we'll we'll play with that a little bit. And if we're if we see trouble in there, you know, we'll have a back door. But that's what we're we're going to launch that probably. Um, I, I'm still looking and trying to get comfortable, but probably next week. Yeah, and the great thing is is that. Uh, James has someone that's managing other money for him, but I think you're kind of like, hey, I think I could probably do a better job than the dude that's that's managing some money for you through all this. Yes, uh, so peeking in on their the account they're managing for me during this big up move, you know, three or four hundred points in in in, in four or five weeks, um, you know. They, they did a lot better than I was doing for sure. So, uh, but now, you know, kind of like I told you, Bobby, it's a tortoise in the hair, you know, uh, is the market going to go up by 8% every month or every month and a half? I don't think so. Uh, that'd be a 70% return or so. I, I, I doubt that's going to happen. So, uh, while I wish them the best because they have my best interest, I, I, if, if I catch up with them, I'm going to have some, a little bit, take a little bit of pride in that, I guess. Absolutely. John's got a great question. Is James using the same portfolio Greek metrics as Sweet Bobby, a variation and acceptable level, something different altogether? That's the wonderful thing is that James was able to use the same spreadsheet with the same metrics that we do to uh, manage this account. James, I think it worked out really well for, for this type plan. Yes, it, it did. Now, I will say that, uh, you know, I, I try not to, to bring a market directional bias into it, but sometimes you can't help but layer up some of that, whether you want to or not. Uh, you may not even know your bias is there, but when it comes down to actually pulling the trigger on a trade, you, you, you have some bias. So uh, we took a calculated, we looked at uh, the spreadsheet. That was our guide, or that, uh, yes, the, the, the uh, Greeks and, and uh, the portfolio, the metrics there. And uh, I made a calculated decision, decision to carry a little bit more negative deltas than, you know, not by much, but just that little, shade of market bias, directional bias was, was there with me, but it wasn't extreme. So, but other than that, I'd say uh, uh, we didn't have a red light on the thing and uh, open it up today and it's all, everything is green. Uh, so there's no violations of that, of those metrics, uh, of those Greeks. And the cool thing is we kind of thought it might be important to start 
uh, keeping up with James's uh, Vega number as well. So we we certainly included that. That's in everybody's spreadsheet as well. If you want to track Vega, I know some of you are. And we kind of looked at his uh, Delta Vega ratio a little bit. So he was comfortable with carrying negative deltas most of the time in the, to offset the Vega risk uh, that often happens when the market goes down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, this is just a great story. Anyone got any questions or comments for James at all that you guys want to ask him about his strategy or how it went? Can't believe Ed's not asking something. Ed would have a question. Yep. And by the way, uh, Ed, you know, I've had a few conversations with Ed and I appreciate him as well. And, all that he's doing and Evan and uh, I haven't met Evan, but uh, I've read all of his stuff. Uh, and there's some great, there's, there's um, the contributors to this, the trader nerd community is just awesome. And uh, you may not know it, but I read all your stuff and um, it, it's a, it's a nice polite community and uh, everybody is, uh, you know, treats each other with respect and I fully endorse it. When uh, his uh, Discord name is Jet, J-E-T, aptly so. Trey wants to know, James, what is your go-to method of managing your deltas? How, how do you, what do you do to manage your deltas? Well, when we look, uh, uh, pull up the spreadsheet, and uh, if our, our body of deltas are too large, um, we're looking to... Uh, um, make a trade that will uh, tweak that. And, uh, and so far that has been successful and, and we can get everything in the green almost on, on one trade. Just, you know, if we, we may want to uh, trade a 10 tranche or maybe it's gonna take a 20 tranche or maybe we back up and we do uh, less, but uh, We've always been able to, to keep in the green, or if we were in the red, then, uh, you know, that was uh, uh, a calculated decision uh, to, to let that uh, creep, creep red. But um, so if the deltas were too negative, uh, then we would, uh, we would get, you know, get in on one side or the other of the market and, and uh, uh, create some positive deltas to get back in the green. Yeah, like the one day where the market was up and you actually sold puts instead of doing anything on the call side. Stacy right. wants to know, James, are you entering puts and calls or the entire iron condor at once or entering each side based on metrics? How, how are you kind of doing that? A lot of times we do enter at the same time, but the, uh, my trading plan allows uh, that to be done uh, independent of the other. So uh, there may be a market condition that uh, it would be better uh, to go in separately uh, and to manage uh, separately. So we got to one point with this big up move that we had, we were twice as heavy on the put side than we were on the call side and rightly so. And it sure helped our, our little uh, ball to center up there. Uh, and uh, you know, so if the market continues downward and swings the other way, then we'll probably load up and be a little bit, uh, you know, heavier on the, on the call side. John says, great job, James. Thanks for sharing your story. Look forward to your insight in the future. Maybe even your own nerd niche room. <laughs> well, Hey, as a student, I am absorbing. I'm like a sponge. So I, I, I I'd like to, uh, continue to uh, soak up the content everybody's created out there. Oh, we'd certainly give James his own nerd niche room if he wants to, for sure. We do that. Uh, Glenn says, uh, speaking of trading plans, do you have a written one that you're willing to share or, or what is that? I mean, you know, I, I hate anybody just copying someone's, you know, plan or like that because everybody's got to, you know, and he certainly made, he took my plan and made it his own, certainly. Uh, did a wonderful job with that. Do you want to talk about your trading plan at all? Yeah, the trading plan uh, is there. Um, I think I've sent it. 
I sent it uh, to Ed, I think, but that was, we've made a few tweaks. So it, the, the, we had a good hard plan, but as you learn things, uh, you know, there's a, there's a right and a wrong way to do things and you don't want to keep doing something wrong. So we have, I have evolved to some degree and I still have a few tweaks left on that trading plan. So I hate to uh, uh, put it out there at the moment, but uh, at some point in time, if I can feel satisfied that it is the right plan, I'll, I certainly won't mind sharing. Uh, Hal wants to know, what's your plan if the VIX is cut in half and the wings of the iron condor come in much closer to the market price? Yeah, I'm a, I, I do uh, have some anxiety over uh, getting too close to the spot. So uh, if VIX is, uh, starts uh, going way down, probably at this point in time, uh, I'm going to experiment with accepting less premium and uh, trying to stay stay wide. But you were able, I mean, you, you saw, you know, VIX getting under 20, uh, of course, on those up moves, and you were still getting wide out. It seems like I remember $12.60 as some of the premium that you were collecting on some of those iron condors. Is that is my memory right on the amount of premium you were getting? Yeah, I, I was uh, looking at the spreadsheet earlier, and I can see that they're ranging from $10 to $14, depending on VIX. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but he's still able to get way out of the money. So what was it, 11 deltas on one side, seven on the other, something like that? Right. Now, I, I will say this. I am uh, a little more skittish on the call side. So I'm trying to be in the seven um, delta or less, eight, seven, and uh, just depending. Uh, you, you know, I, my trading plan gives me some flexibility there. Um, so, uh, and that flexibility will, will help, you know, I will have from time to time, there are certain ways that you have a market direction bias and uh, that, but on the call side, I, I'm definitely trying to, I'm playing with lower deltas. And Glenn wants to know, have you ever traded calendars or diagonals in low VIX? Um, I, I have not. We uh, kind of came up with, what, what was it we kind of came up with at some point? We, we did do, we played with a, uh, butterfly at some point uh, as one of the things, but I don't think we ever incorporated that. But that was that was kind of an interesting thing, just to look what a butterfly did, uh, where some of your max risk was. Yes, we went through that exercise, and actually we studied that for yeah. a couple of sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably not uh, still not bad. I just never pulled the trigger on it. Right. All right, any other questions for James? James, this has been great. I mean, it's just uh, really, really good to to see your success. I know you're going to be a success. And uh, everybody, just uh, another round of applause and congratulations for James. James, thanks for joining us today and sharing your story. It's really, really been very inspiring. All right. Well, hey, I'm happy to be here. And uh, just a big thank you to everyone uh, that uh, is creating content. And um, I'm I'm I have uh, I have absorbed a lot of it. Thank you very much. How do I get off the uh, screen here?